Yeah, it's great to see everyone here today. I um, want to welcome us to the Creating Our Constitution community call. There's only 11 slides, including this title slide. So what Penn and I are really looking forward to is the discussion afterwards, um, because we want to hear from more voices. Um, and we're proud that in this presentation, it won't just be Penn and myself, but there's going to be three additional speakers um, as well as additional working group members um, representing 10 additional people from the GOSH community um, who have joined Penn and myself in, in working on this. And we're happy to share our work in progress. Um, Penn, would you like to say anything on this slide? Sure, thank you, Liz. And um, as Liz said, um, you know, I think I'm really grateful to be part of this process and work with a wonderful array of different GOSH community members um, on working on our constitution. And uh, I think I'll just add a little bit on how we got to this point. And it actually started all those years ago, right? Uh, from the original governance working group started again by some GOSH community members, including the founders of GOSH. Um, uh, that, that started the process of thinking about uh, how do we work and make decisions together. Um, Liz will explain a little bit more on that, but uh, the original governance working group led to the first election that created the GOSH Community Council. Uh, both Liz and I are members of that first community council. Um, we've had two elections so far, uh, including the second one that was last year. Uh, there's going to be another election in a few months. Uh, and so first of all, I encourage everyone to participate in this election. Don't forget to uh, register and vote for your community council. Now, over the past couple of years, one of the things that the community council has been working on is to listen to the wider GOSH community on um, what other you know, governance principles should we uh, ratify into uh, what we're now calling the constitution? Because the previous work was mostly around you know, getting just enough done to have a minimum viable election to produce the council. But now the council is trying to develop this into a more complete constitution that uh, describes how we work together. Um, and we've been so lucky to have received so much help from the wider community. It's a really humbling process for me. It is a complicated process, but such a great learning process for all of us. And I'm, you know, again, grateful for that. So uh, I think Liz will say something about the next slide. I will say a little bit about uh, the three main groups that people are working on for the constitution. I will also mention some of the people who are working on a few other things and so on. And then we will hand off to someone from each of the three groups to give a brief summary, and then we will go to that discussion. Over. Okay, great. So um, we've almost covered what's on this slide, but why, why we want to hold power together is so we can help each other more and get more done as a group. Like why, why do we come together? We have a roadmap. We know we're, we're bringing open science hardware into being and into production. Um, but any more details on, on how we can best assist each other um, remains kind of vague. Um, but we know we want to, we know there's strength when we come together, but how do we determine how to use that strength? That's really what this slide is about. So Penn mentioned that um, we've been doing listening and running elections. And so you may have run into um, a previous um, interaction with Penn and myself, who are the folks on the council who handle governance. Um, you may have run into our election autopsy or election evaluation process. And that's what we ran community-wide in four languages. Thank you, Bree, and everyone who participated after the first election. And we revised the election process 
to run it again in 2022. And then um, for those of you who had the opportunity to be in Panama with GOSH, you may have noticed the community council table where Penn and I and all the council members, we just spent time listening um, to over a quarter of the total number of conference attendants, asking everyone, what is your previous experience with group decision-making? And that really led to a lot of flushing out of um, new ideas that we could use to, to work together and hold power together. And it actually led to the working groups um, that Penn is going to describe. And a, a note about these working groups, we, as council members, as an empowered group, that's a technical term, empowered by the election of the GOSH membership, we- This is um, not Liz, but there's this board that was elected. Hey, sorry, um, can you repeat the question? I think there was just someone unmuted on accident, and so I, I muted them. <laughs> Oh, okay, great. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, as more this these kind of working groups that are backed by the authority of elected council members um, are they really work side by side with council people in in a way in an exciting new format for Gosh, um, where everything's been ad hoc and wonderful because of that. But this is like um, these are like empowered groups. All right, that's it for this slide. Over to you, Penn. Okay, thanks, Liz. Yeah, so um, there are three uh, working groups who uh, are comprised of various uh, GOSH community members who responded to one of our forum threads asking for this help. Um, the three working groups are working on three different parts of the constitution that describes, first of all, some of the things that happen inside GOSH. One is, again, fleshing out uh, the details of how we run elections uh, based on what we've learned from previous elections. But, you know, again, like, how do we want to do this going forward? Uh, the second one is about the GOSH regions. So as most of you know, uh, we are so fortunate to be part of an incredibly diverse and global community. Uh, in particular, there are regional uh, gatherings such as Regosh uh, across you know, South America, uh, Africa Ash across Africa, and there might even be other regional gatherings coming in the near future. Uh, so what is the relationship between all of these regional gatherings and the global uh, Gosh community? is something the second group is thinking about and codifying into the constitution. Uh, so these relationships, right? And the third group is thinking about how uh, we work with organizations outside of GOSH. So how do you approach and manage these partnerships? For example, uh, there is a group that most of you know about, which is the Open Science Hardware Foundation. It is not to be confused with GOSH, even though they are founded by some of the same people. Um, now, the Open Science Hardware Foundation has been tremendously helpful for the wider GOSH community, in particular by obtaining um, this wonderful grant from the Alfred Sloan Foundation uh, to fund so much of the work that we have been doing. This work includes some of the events funding, and uh, the workshop funding and the writing of uh, um, you know, funding that has been um, you know, dispersed over the past couple of years. Uh, they've also supported the latest in-person gathering that we had in Panama uh, and uh, for example, the micro grants funding that happened earlier this year. So the Open Science Hardware Foundation has been tremendously helpful in supporting GOSH and also supporting people like Bree as the community coordinator for this wonderful community. Uh, however, the Open Science Harbor Foundation is not the only group that GOSH might associate with. So this third working group for uh, governance is thinking about how do we define our relationships with these external organizations? 
uh, and how do we initiate them in the future. Uh, people from these three groups will be talking about their work, but before I hand this virtual microphone to them, I will also briefly mention that we have a couple of other community members uh, that are helping us. For example, Gu Jian is helping us uh, with writing parts of the constitution that refers to the amazing work that has been done by the Code of Conduct Working Group and how they relate these documents together. Um, and uh, uh, we are also working with Marina, who is not here today, but uh, she uh, is very important because she was a member of the original governance working group from 2020. And she is helping uh, uh, us with the integration work of pulling this entire constitution together. So I just want to give a shout out to these people um, uh, who are also helping with this process. Uh, I think that's my summary for, for uh, these three working groups. Do you have anything to add, Liz, or shall we move on to um, the first group? Over. Great. Here's the next slide. All right, so shall we have someone from the election group uh, give us the summary of what they're working on. Yes, um, thank you, everyone. Um, I'll be representing my group. My name is Ibuka Izuke, like I said previously. Um, these are members, Akoridi, Maurice, and Mark. All right, can you just um, go to the next slide? All right. <clears throat> So thank you very much again. Um, we worked on all things election and I believe you can all hear me clearly, right? All right, okay. So um, I'm going to pick the points one after the other as we worked on them. So for adjusting number and quotas for seats, we decided that we have um, a maximum of seven council members and a minimum of three council members. So that is what we're proposing. And then for voter eligibility, we are proposing that for you to be able to vote as a member of GOSH, you must at least have an account which is a month old. That is, you must be a member of the GOSH community for at least one month. So the second requirement for you to be able to vote is that you must have at least made two forum posts on the community since the last election, right? So, and then the next thing is that we are recommending that for elections we're going to have going forward, um, we, we should have election observers, right? And we're proposing we have three election observers and we, um, call for volunteers from the community who are going to act as um, these observers for the GOSH community. So how we want to do it is that if we call for volunteers and then it turns out that we have more volunteers than the slots, then we can just find a way of um, carrying out a raffle draw to like pick the three election observers we want. All right, so on referenda, what types of decisions should require a referendum? So for this, we listed um, about three decisions that we felt um, would require a referendum. And then one of them is installing the constitution. Though um, previously, Liz was um, actually saying something about this. I don't know if she'll still talk about that. And then secondly, we are looking at making changes to the constitution as another decision that should require a referendum. And then finally, the third decision we felt should require a referendum is removing a seated councillor. All right, so for the next, we have this question, what amount of community participation would be valid? So we felt every member of the community should be able to take part in any referendum. 
All right, for the next question, it says, how can the community set the agenda for what should go to referendum? So we decided that we dedicate a topic on the forum to start referendum petition threads, right? So if the petition thread achieves enough support from the community, then the council has to hold referendum on the issue the thread petitioned for. Then finally, um, before we got the last message from Liz, we're actually looking at these two last points as the tasks we have ahead of us. So I don't know, maybe um, Liz will get to talk about that. I don't know if we should still um, work on that because it has to do with analyzing anonymized demographic data from previous elections and analyzing post-mortem of previous election. So get to hear more from Liz. Thank you very much. Great, um, thank you for that. Um, I heard my name tagged in on this and um, Brie has provided the um, anonymized spreadsheet of, of election registration. And um, I shared the questions that people answered on that spreadsheet in with this election group so that everyone could see that demographic data was not collected but membership, affiliation, participation in various regional groups and regional events was collected. And it looks like about half of, so drum roll please, like the of gosh voters, about half of voters state that they are members of or have participates in events of regional goshes. Uh, check from me. You wanna, does this group wanna add anything else before we go to the next group? No, nothing else. Thank you. Oh, trying to change the slide. Let's do it. Here we go. Hi everyone. Uh, hope everyone can hear me right. Great. Okay, so I'm up for, uh, representing our group. My name is Carl Kadu and my colleagues, uh, Suleiman and Gina. Unfortunately, we don't have Gina today. She's, uh, she has a tight schedule, but uh, we hope that we are representing well. Yes, we can move on to the next slide. So, uh oh. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Liz. So in, uh, in a nutshell, our task uh, entailed answering basically four questions that we try to compress into this over a crowded slide. So we, look, we looked at how, how does, in answering how does GOSH approach and partnerships, we answered basically four questions. How does GOSH initiate a partnership, for example, initiate all how does the, pass, the other person initiate to partner with GOSH, the other around? <clears throat> Not only GOSH initiating. The nature of relationship that GOSH gets into and uh, how to formalize these relationships um, and uh, the terms of these relationships. So what you might not see here, but we start what we what might eventually come to Liz and Tim that gave us assignment, we started off by identify, uh, define what a partnership is. And it's in simple terms, a partnership is uh, uh, a cooperation between individuals, organizations that agree to achieve a certain objective. And uh, just like any other business, partnerships have risks and advantages. So it's not, uh, some things are best uh, delivered with a partnership, and then certain things are not just delivered in a partnership. So some of the items that you, all points that have to consider before going to partnerships, is it worth, you have to, uh, both said, like Gosh has to consider and analyze, like, is it worth going to such a partnership or can we achieve this as Gosh without partnering with anyone? And by Gosh, we don't, they could be, it could be internally, it could be maybe Africa Osh with uh, regional Oshes or all individuals within Gosh. So, <clears throat> Now this brings me to the slide. So the nature and importance of partnerships currently sought by GOSH. Why should GOSH go for partnership? And uh, we zeroed on three reasons. 
So to strengthen communities while seeking new alliances. It's always good to work with people. And it's always because when you work with people, it gives an impression to others that you are like, is a person to work with. So as you work with other people, it also attracts other potential funders or sources of corporations to come with to come work with you or initiate partnerships with you. So it's always good to strengthen uh, collaborations in, in anticipation that you'll get better alliances in the future. Um, the second one is uh, cap increased capacity for research, for example, through collaborations. We understand the different members of within GOSH are working on achieving different aspects of their research, but there's, most, there's a lot of research going on within GOSH. So if you can leverage on these, uh, and partnerships are the own, uh, some of the ways to uh, work together to achieve uh, a faster product or attain a particular product or aspect or something that you're working on as a group. So if partnership at times comes in handy uh, to achieve something faster than working alone. And the third one is capacity building. Um, we all understand that we come from different backgrounds within GOSH. So we, how do we um, help those coming that are, don't have the same advantages as some of some of others in the group, those that are at a higher level, those at our level. So to, for us to pass on uh, knowledge and uh, exchanges for different aspects, it's always good from these partnerships uh, to help others grow and eventually help the entire community grow and maybe be at par at, at, at a certain level. So those are the three main uh, reasons that to look at for and why, and why GOSH should be going to a partnerships. And then that brings me to the second point. How do we now identify credible and reliable partnerships? Like I mentioned earlier, partnerships are both risky and important at the same time. So it's really important to have a background check on all the potential people you're seeking to partner with. It could be an individual, could be an organization. It's always important to understand uh, the interest of the other person, um, what they're working on as an organization or an individual, what, what do they anticipate to achieve in this partnership and what do you anticipate to achieve as gosh, so that uh, the relationship does not turn out to melt us as, because that's not the case. So you have to understand your way, the interests of the other group are going to the interests of gosh. So if, if you're on good terms, then you can go proceed with uh, with a partnership. And it's always important to constantly uh, create and maintain uh, a detailed list or a database of potential partners. So this does not necessarily mean that you have to undergo a background check of everyone in detail, but it's always to keep an eye on who the potential uh, partners are, or you want the potential people to partner with in the future, in the short term, in the long term, in the near future so that you have a database and you could segregate them as trusts, as individuals, as funds, uh, so that, and then you keep on reviewing and all approaching them and see if who you want to partner with, if they are really a, a, a good match or not. So having this continuously updated uh, database would would come in handy. The process of how and maintaining the, <laughs> the database could be, a tricky one, but I, it can easily be, I guess it can, with all of us coming together, it could be answered and decide on how to be the particular aspects uh, implemented. A third one would be determine the nature and the length of a partnership you wish to go into. So not every, some partnerships are long term, some partnerships are short term. So you need to understand as you approach these potential partners, is it an event-based partnership? Or is it program-based? I use supporting a particular, uh, maybe a research project. It has to be clear on how you want to go into, is on what you want to achieve in a particular, with a particular partnership. So the length of time also matters. At times as you weigh the advantage, as you assuming you've done the background studies about this particular partner, and you realize there must, there might be some risks and you weigh them and you, you decide that the best way to go forward with this particular partnership is short term. It could be event best and leave it at that. And maybe not because that particular partner long term. So those aspects might come through. Uh, 
bullet three, approaching a potential partner. Now, assuming you've done all the background research about the particular partners, and they also done, uh, done the same about GOSH, so it's always important to have now a formal introduction. You're making a letter of intent, and this could be a draft, uh, a template that GOSH will eventually decide, and so that people can use it all, uh, use it as and when a particular, a particular interest in partnership raises. So in usually a letter of intent, you explain your vision, and you now you're writing to the potential partner, and you are reaching out and you are initiating. Explain your vision and why you think they are the right partner. What you what you think you can achieve working together. You explain why they are they are really compatible with working with Gosh. The benefits for both parties. Now the, this is the icebreaker. Assuming all everything goes well with the potential, you've written the letter of intent and uh, they're willing to give you an audience. Now this is where the hard work comes in: building, formalizing, and maintaining the partnership. You, you broke the ice, now you need to establish clear roles and responsibilities. Remember, the other side have their own interests, you also have your own interests, but you have a, set, a, a certain aspect that is bringing you together. So you have to stick to that and the, and the objectives of the project you want to achieve. So have make sure that each side has clear roles and responsibilities. You should know expectation, what is expected of each side. Assess the strengths and weaknesses of each side what are you bringing on table? What are you bring? What is Gosh bringing on table? What's the other side bringing on table? What are their weaknesses? What are your weaknesses? And how do you plan to plug all these loopholes so that they don't affect the actual implementation of the program? Most importantly, be as open as possible from the word go. Because if you are not as open as, as possible and then things start creeping in at during the implementation phase, this might not turn out as good as you want to be. So always be as open as possible in your in negotiations. So agree on the scope of the work objectives. How long do you want the, this cooperation to go for? Is it short term? Is it long term? Is it project based? All those need to be cl clear, clarified. Uh, then or is formalized. Formalization come in different forms, and this is usually defined by the nature of the partnership that you're going after. So it could be an MOU, it could be a contract, it could be an award. Some partnerships, you it could be that Gosh is receive, simply receiving funding, and uh, the, the the other part is only giving you a contract. So you, you need to formalize this relationship and read to the detail the the terms and conditions for that grant or award. And so that the, the, the entire process is formalized and you don't have issues coming up later in the process of you implementing the program. Thirdly, always monitor, evaluate, and report. Uh, don't always wait for the end of the program to or the partnership to end. So continuously endeavor, endeavor to monitor the progress of the implementation phase to ensure that uh, what you agreed upon is what is going on. And uh, if there are any gaps, you plug them immediately or address them immediately and uh, evaluate as, so evaluation is the source, is a potential for so many reasons. It could be to evaluate the progress of how the partnership is going, could be to inform the future continuity of the partnership. As you evaluate, do you want to continue or is this, or do you, along the way realize that this is not a right partnership you should go into, and maybe you're simply picking the lessons. So as you evaluate and you're going along, these are lessons you should be picking along. You don't necessarily have to terminate the contract, but it could be good, good, good growth ways. And always report, regularly agree on the reporting period. I usually recommend like quarterly basis. So provide reports on the progress of, of the, on the of the of the partnership, how is it going? Uh, are there issues that need to be addressed by both parties? Uh, address them. And financial reportings, finances are usually cause of uh, trouble, so that area needs to be addressed, and people need to be reporting on on time. And uh, yes, so finally, what we consider a next step. Uh, we think that uh, 
what you said above can go into the constitution. However, for for this particular section to be implemented, there must there could be or there will be a more detailed uh, uh, aspect or project like called a partnership policy policy report that will have a detailed uh, probably approved by the council, but to have, should have detailed uh, aspects like the kind of the nature of relationship that Gosh at, at a particular period is willing to go into. So there are different reasons to go into a partnership, but the council might decide that for this particular, maybe within a period of two years, these are the kind of partnerships we would want to go into. And so that they guide the process of uh, creating a database and all that, because you know what you're looking for, you have objectives, you have uh, timelines to go into, to, to follow rather. So the document of the nature of relationships, um, time frame, uh, all that could could be shouldered by the council. That's a say it's a kind of still a discussion to go into. But how the function should be coordinated? How does how will council delegate this role? Who does it? Do we do we throw it to the community and everyone simply updates like a spreadsheet of potential? Okay, hey everyone in the community, can you identify potential partners and you key them in and then maybe a select group evaluates those potential partnerships depending on what we need or do we put up a call and say okay we have an event now we are looking for potential partners and everyone draws in and then the select committee selects and reaches out to them and then uh, most importantly that every partnership assuming of goal should be or will be ratified uh, by the council so after all everything is done the contract is drawn before it's signed uh, it has to be taken to the council read through and then once they approve that everything is okay and they give it a thumbs up, uh, then ink ink can hit the paper or the dotted line and hope for the best. Yeah, in summary, that's uh, what we had. If there are any questions, uh, fire them away. Thank you so much for the audience. Thank you so much. Incredible. Um, <clears throat> we'll save questions to the end, but please do write them down uh, for those of you following along. And we'll go to the third of our three working groups and then come pull it all back together for discussion. Great, Frank. Oh. Hi, everyone. Um, I am a one of man Annie, so. <laughs> I'm going to turn off my camera, unfortunately. So, um, Liz, could you please? So, um, my work was to um, my work was to uh, was about the Gosh regions and how the global Gosh relates or should relate to regional gatherings. But I did extend it to their communities also because I found that, that uh, regional gatherings also have uh, regional communities, so I didn't want to exclude uh, the communities also. So the questions that came up during my research was what are regional Gosh gatherings or what are regional Gosh uh, communities? And also, what are the big regional gosh gatherings that we have? So we have Africa Osh, we have Big Osh, and like Penn said earlier, there might be other regional gatherings and communities in the future, including the Southeast Asia gosh also. And also to understand how they come about, how they came about, and uh, how they currently work. And also to establish if there is a pre-existing relationship between the uh, regional GOSH and the wider GOSH communities. And also how do these regional GOSH uh, gatherings and communities relate with each other. So what we, I am proposing is, most importantly, is defining what regional GOSH is relating to the gathering and also to the community. And also defining a focused area of regional GOSH gatherings, what regional GOSH should be or should focus or what their activities should be about. So there wouldn't be any confusion on what regional GOSHs are. 
And uh, this third one was translating the GOSH roadmap into accepted language, regional languages. The GOSH manifesto has been translated to, I think, more than three, three languages. But unfortunately, the GOSH roadmap hasn't been. It's only in English. So it's also important to, to ex and it's imp also important that in establishing relationship between regional GOSHs and uh, the wider GOSH community, the roadmap is essential, as an essential part of the wider GOSH community. So translating the roadmap into the uh, accepted regional languages also certifies the existence of that, that region. And um, we also, I also, <laughs> Uh, suggest that it should be a, a direct information channel between GOSH regions and the global GOSH community or the, the GOSH council also, where the monthly calls between GOSH and its regions. Uh, unfortunately, not all regional community members are on GOSH's, on all of GOSH's uh, platforms like the forum or WhatsApp group. So it is up to regional communities to deliver down information from the wider GOSH community to their regional members. And to do that, there has to be this direct uh, flow of information about the wider GOSH community to the regional communities and from the regional communities about their activities, their projects and whatnot, also to the wider GOSH community. So there is an information flow and exchange of uh, what's going on in both, in all regions and also the wider GOSH community. And uh, yeah, the fifth is also establishing a financial support system for GOSH regions also. GOSH should be, should also provide financial support to uh, regional, regional communities and their gardens. So some of the approaches that I am suggesting is the first is uh, grants and funding. These grants can provide financial resources to support regional gardens and their activities. And it could be a criteria for grants eligibility. I think we've already seen that uh, with the micro grant and other uh, grants schemes that GOSH has initiated. And also sponsorship and partnerships. Uh, like how I talked about partnership, and if if it's in the power and the, in the capacity of Bosch um, to seek sponsorship from organizations and to establish partnership with entities that are also interested in supporting regional gatherings and their activities, and this could involve collaborating with corporate sponsors, with foundations, with governmental bodies that share similar goals and values. And these partnerships can provide financial assistance or resources or in-kind support to regional gardens and their communities and also their, um, their communities. Um, also, fundraising campaigns could be very helpful. So through my research, I found out that between Africa Osh and Rigosh, there has been uh, no fundraising campaigns for these respective communities. So it would be important for GOSH to, if they could organize a fundraising campaigns to raise funds specifically designated for regional gardens in their, in their respective communities. And also resource allocation, where probably a, a portion of the GOSH budget could be allocated directly to supporting regional gatherings and their activities. And most importantly, I, I believe this is the most important part, is that um, we could leverage the experience that the community council has and also the global GOSH community, the expertise and knowledge that they have to support regional gatherings in their, in their communities. And they can provide guidance and advice and mentorships on financial management, fundraising strategies, and sustainable revenue generation models 
So regional communities and their governments wouldn't be solely dependent on, on gosh. And the last one is representation at the gosh gatherings. So what we are proposing is that regional gardens like Africa Osh and Regosh, and in the future, any other regional gosh should have allocated and dedicated time during their global gosh gatherings to talk about their activities and their initiatives, and also to keep new gosh, gosh members uh, informed about regional gosh also. So this will allow them to inform the broader gosh community about their ongoing and upcoming regional events and also have the opportunity to share the potential and, and all anticipated outcomes of their endeavors with the broader gosh community. So this is what I've been working on. And um, if anyone has any questions or any suggestions or ideas on what shouldn't or what should be part of this, I would appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that brings us to the next steps. So for everyone who's been listening, I do hope that you've written down questions um, because even because we have time now, five minutes before the top of the hour, but I can certainly stay on to hear. Um, this is great. Yeah, discussion starting in the chat. So um, this is time for input into our work in progress. I'm going to wrap up um, saying three points. One, thanking all of these people for their deep and detailed work. Um, uh, Penn and I are so honored to be able to work with 10 additional GOSH community members to think deeply about how we work together and, and become more powerful together. Um, second point, I think for those of you listening along, you could hear how um, questions and ideas and interest from one of the working groups, whether it was elections, whether it was forming relationships with external organizations, or whether it was how regions of GOSH relate internally within GOSH, you can see how questions began to implicate and be dependent on other domains. So we really did need a lot of our brains and hearts to think deeply about this. And my third of three points is what do we get after going through all of this vegan sausage making? And so that's a, that's a metaphor for looking closely in the details, which for those of us who focus on engineering, <clears throat> Maybe, you know, but I think also a lot of us run our hacker spaces and we write our grants, we manage our grants, and we do know these things, but maybe we don't talk about them as much. Um, but talking about them together in, as a GOSH community will let, let us stay on mission, be highly coordinated at speed and scale so that when we get an idea, we know instantly get that partnership template. Yes, we can open up a fundraising portal like set up that event, like we can begin moving faster together um, to achieve our goals. So with that, um, can I uh, turn it over? Pan, I don't know if you want to say any wrapping up thoughts, but I would appreciate if Bree or someone else could facilitate the community discussion questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Liz. I don't have too much to add. Thank you for wrapping that up. I'll just note that we're coming up at the hour, so I understand if some people have to run. Uh, but even if you do have to run, uh, and, and if you have questions or comments or critiques, uh, please feel free to also put them in the chat, and we will try to look at that as well. And thank you so much again, everyone, for coming today, and a uh, huge thanks for, um, for your support. Over.